Negro League gave me an experience that I, I never will forget. They paid me a, a dollar and a half a day to eat on, $150 a month. But that was an extra bonus to me because I'd have played baseball for nothing. That's how much I wanted to play. They give me a chance. If it hadn't been for them, no telling where I'd be at. And I'd probably be in the cotton fields of South Carolina right now. I was born in Macon, Georgia. And I used to go down and watch the white, white guys play when there wasn't no black players on the team, all white team. And I said, my father, I said to my father, I said, you know, I could play just as good as that guy there, you know. He said, yeah, I know that. He said, but you're the wrong color. So uh, in, in that sense, I, I, I understood that it wasn't me as a ball player. It was me as a black man. The Negro League accomplishments meant so much because uh, that's all we had to aspire to when we were coming along. They hadn't even thought about uh, including us, you know, in the, in, the, in the organized baseball. Baseball was it was in our blood, and uh, that's that was the most important thing. The fact that we were playing, and that's why Reuben Foster came up with the idea to to develop the Negro League. He said, "Look, we can't play there. We're going to have a league. We're going to play somewhere." Here's a league born out of segregation that becomes the driving force for social change in our country. There were two separate baseball leagues operating simultaneously to, to one another. You know, one gave the, the best white athlete an opportunity to showcase his baseball skills. The other did the same exact thing for the best black and Hispanic baseball players. So there are still those who believe that if it didn't happen in the major leagues, then it didn't happen. We're here to tell you that it did happen and it happened in spectacular fashion. Why is there this inclination for people to live only among themselves and to keep others out? When I was a kid in Alabama, I used to say, why is the world upside down because Jackie Robinson's playing second base? Why, why, why are white people throwing cats on the field and spiking them? They don't want him to play second base. Why is that? And why wouldn't they serve me at Woolworth? Back then, there, there, there were no shades of gray. It was black and white, literally, and you knew what side of the street you were supposed to be on, when you were supposed to be there. Blacks can't, were not allowed to play baseball. They steered away from professional baseball because they didn't want Jack Robinson to compete with them. Why? He may, he may be as good as they are. There are still so many folks who did not know a Negro Leagues existed. But then you stop and think, they really had no way to know because this history was never documented in the pages of American history books. So really countless generations of us have gone through our own formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not only in baseball history, but American history. A lot of places we couldn't eat, a lot of places we couldn't, uh, could, uh, couldn't take a bath, not unless it was, we went in a creek, washed off in a creek, washed the uniform in a creek, and driving down the highway, put the uniform out in the window so it can dry out for the next, next game we'll play. Because of segregation, there was so little that you could do, so little that you were allowed to do. But Negro League Baseball was one of the things that we could do, and we did it well. Wherever we went, we was called all kind of names. And uh, we didn't have decent places to eat. We didn't have places to stay. And some of the people didn't let uh, some of the ball players stay in their homes. We'd sleep in the bus. And uh, just sleep in and go to the next town. I was assigned a contract for the Indianapolis Clown, $250 a month, and $2 for eat every day. When I sleep it all night in the bus, I sleep all night. And I come to the town, I say, no, 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 give me the sleep in the morning because I've been sleeping in the, night, in the bus all night long. Give me the sleep in the morning. How much are you going to pay for the room? Give it to me. The advice that I got from Jackie Robinson, Larry Dovey, 
Monta Irvin, when you walk across those white lines, there are people that are gonna call you names. They didn't say you should win, they say you better win. It's no different than slavery and picking cotton back in the day. I think uh, uh, they knew what was ahead and they knew what they had to do to make it to that next level. Well, the social injustices that a lot of the players in the Negro Leagues had to endure was downright deplorable. You know, a normal person would look at that and couldn't perform daily functions. While these extraordinary gentlemen were going out and playing at an elite level, a very difficult and challenging game. I'd like to think I'd be able to get through it, but the truth is some of the things that I've read and some of the stories that I've heard from some of the guys, um, I, I can't imagine going through it for as long as they went through it uh, just to play the game. Negro League players played under the conditions uh, that were available to them and they did it and they liked it because of their love of the game. I mean, it, it really is testimony to the strength of the sport and the commitment that these ha players had to the sport. Of course, the conditions were never wonderful when they played. Uh, you know, they were willing to, to suck it up and go out there and play baseball and uh, and I think they carried that same determination over to the major leagues, there's no question. The content of their character shines through more to me than their ability on the field. Uh, the game is hard enough. I think anybody who watches it, anybody who's played it can appreciate that the game on the field is hard enough. When you're doing something you love, um, you're in a safe place. When I'm at the ballpark, I'm in my safe haven and nothing bothers me. I'm not hurting and I think those guys back in the day use baseball as a vehicle to get them to where they needed to be. There are a lot of stories out there about a lot of guys and a lot of numbers that, that may be embellished in some ways and may not be embellished in some ways, but the truth is they are superheroes of the game that are rarely mentioned in the same breath with a lot of the names that are, are mentioned with our game, and I think that's unfortunate. The talent level in the Negro Leagues was close to major league talent. I, I think it's a very fair and honest assessment to say that. They could play. They could play and they changed the way that this game was played as they did transition into the major leagues, but they also changed our country for the better as well. Playing in the Negro Leagues was really important in a lot of cities, in parts of our culture. There was a certain celebrity associated with that. Um, and I, I think that their satisfaction with playing in the Negro Leagues was a re reflection of that. And I think it's really important to understand that component. Well, my father was a great baseball fan, and we used to, he used to take me to Sunday doubleheaders at the Polo Grounds or Yankee Stadium. This was in the 30s and early 40s. That's when they were getting 45 and 50,000 people in those doubleheaders, you know. But I think that's what the Negro Leagues did an amazing job. They made it a fun place to come out there and people came straight from church to go out there in their Sunday best, whether it was white fans or black fans or fans in between, just looking for a great game of baseball. So I think it was a mixture of seeing some things that you couldn't see on a normal basis and coming out there and knowing that once you spent however much money that you were for your seat to watch this game, you were definitely going to be enjoyed. I remember seeing Satchel Page. I don't remember how many times I saw him, but I, did, I know I saw him a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, I, what I remember about him was he used to strike people out. Yeah. And I always thought it was, it was so strange because this skinny guy could throw the ball past all these big, big guys. Yeah. But it was amazing to me. Yeah. The face of the Negro Leagues, as well as the spirit of the Leagues, no one embodied the skill, gifts, tools, talents, and pure fun that emanated from Satchel Paige. Satchel Paige was a 42-year-old rookie, but he proved that if you took care of yourself, if you train yourself in a way that you could play past the age of 35, 36, 37. Anybody who gets to the big leagues for the first time at 42 and goes six and one during a pennant race and helps Cleveland win the World Series must have been one heck of a pitcher. In one game, he called in all of the outfielders and set them behind uh, the mound. The bases loaded, and he struck out three guys. Come on, you know, no, <laughs> nobody really does that. But I think the best Satchel Page story I've ever heard involved Josh Gibson, 
Who in their right mind would walk the bases loaded to face Josh Gibson? We get two outs, and we lead the ball game by a couple of runs. Two outs in the ninth inning. Jerry Benjamin hit the ball down the third base line. He stands up triple. Well, we got two outs. Satchel called me Nancy. He said, Nancy, you know what I'm thinking to do? I said, yeah, I know you're going to get this other guy out. Let's go home. He said, no, I'm going to walk these guys, and, and I'm going to pitch this Josh Gibson. I said, no, man, don't be facetious. He said, you call it what you want, but that's what I'm going to do. He walks one guy, then he walked Buck Leonard, and here comes Josh, and that bat looked that long, man. And he said, Josh, you know, I think you're the greatest hitter in the world. I know I'm the best pitcher in the world. And said, but one day we're going to be on the opposite side. He said, this is the time. Josh said, oh, throw the ball, Satchel. Okay. Satchel said, now I'm going to throw you some fastball, 95 mile an hour fastball, boom, strike one. He said, I'm going to throw you another fastball, but it's going to be a little faster than that one. Throw the ball, Satchel, boom, 100 mile an hour fastball, strike two. He said, now, nah, you know I got the two strikes and no balls. Now, I'm supposed to knock you down, move you off the plate, but I'm not going to throw any smoke at your yoke. I'm going to throw a pee at your knee, 105 mile fastball, boom, right down the middle. Josh, don't move the bat. The ball game's over. We go walking off the field. Satchel's six four, and looked like he was seven feet tall. He said, "You know what, Nancy?" I said, "What, Satchel?" He said, "Nobody, nobody hits Satchel's fastball." I said, "I guess you're right." I never heard of him, you know, with sore arms. But I never heard of him ailing, or on a losing streak, or can't do something, or hurt that can't do this, or you know. He was always Satchel Page. Now when I first met him, first batted against him, he struck me out four times. He said to me, he said, Money, he says, you know, I just want to give you a tip. He said, you'll never hit me. I said, no, why not? He said, you hold your bat too high. He said, by the time you get the bat down and around, he said, I'm by you and gone. I said, okay, well, I'll try, you know, try to drop my bat a little bit. So. In about a month, we played again, and you know, at that time, see, he only got me twice, you know. So he said, see, see, there's 50% uh, uh, improvement. I said, so, I said, you gonna teach me how to hit you? I said, it doesn't make sense. He said, just because I say it doesn't mean you're gonna do it. <laughs> And then on April 15, 1947, make that monumental walk on the field as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, forever changing the game of baseball, but more importantly, forever changing this country. She said, there is no question that you can divide the American 20th century into two pieces, before Jackie and after Jackie. What Jackie accomplished actually was part of a process that led to a much larger social change in our country, um, a social change that we're still working on today. Uh, Jackie Robinson is not only baseball. Jackie Robinson is uh, social justice. When you think of civil rights, uh, social justice, when you think of what America, well, everything that is good about America, he was a, you know, a catalyst uh, for uh, the, where we are today. Uh, Jackie Robinson is not baseball only. Jackie Robinson is uh, a catalyst, almost that leadoff hitter uh, to where we are uh, today in, in our society. He means everything to me. The first baseball player my dad told me about was Jackie Robinson. The reason why I wear my pants up is because of him and all the other Negro League greats that helped pave the way for me. So to get a chance to wear 42 on April 15th for him is an honor and a privilege. To get a chance to meet his wife and his daughter uh, is really great and a blessing to just be a part of that and hopefully continue to spread his legacy. You know, I remember Branch Rickey, you know, saying that, uh, you know, it's going to be tougher for you not to fight back. and and. And he took a lot of abuse, and of course he gave it back on the field in, in uh, uh, really a, a fair way. Uh, but uh, he, he represented not only the way he played baseball, but you know what he was as a man. He opened the doors for all these players, all these things that have happened uh, as far as social justice and inequality. Uh, he carried that burden. Um, he is not, for me, I don't, when I think of Jackie Robinson, again, I, I think of a person that changed society. Rogers bounces out. Jackie Robinson slams a triple to left center. 
Well, I think my greatest moment in baseball was when Jackie Robinson got signed to Major League Baseball. I kind of felt that most all the black players in the Negro League would have a chance to go to the Major League. But I was wrong because what was happening, they was only hiring a couple of ball players a year for each team. Some team wasn't, wasn't hiring any at all. So I feel that Major League Baseball did, did a great damage to the Negro League because they didn't take enough players during those days. They lost good ball players. It was a, a great thing for Jackie Robinson, but um, it was something that I felt that a lot of guys could have made the same step, but they weren't uh, picked to do that. Uh, it turned out that Jagger was the best one for that particular time. Uh, it turned out that way, but it wasn't felt that he was the best ball player. They thought because of his experience, you know, he had been, uh, been in the service, he was an officer, he graduated from UCLA, that they thought he was, he was best equipped to handle the pressures, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there were some guys, you know, Monty Irvin probably could have done it too, you know. You know, uh, there were some guys, that, uh, plenty of guys that were better ball players, no question about it. Uh, he was a good ball player, but he wasn't the best, you know. But I think, you know, uh, he, they made the right choice. But uh, when you think about it, all that pressure finally killed him. He died at 53 years old. Jackie succeeded. He did a great job of pioneering. We're a little sorry that, that uh, it met the demise of uh, the Negro Leagues because uh, all the interest now was seeing what these new major leaguers would do and the attendance dropped off to almost nothing in the, in the Negro Leagues. But you know, that's, that's a penalty uh, that had to be paid. The legacy of the, the Negro Leagues is important not only to me but just baseball in general because it opened up opportunities where there weren't when the Major League Baseball was established and started a long time ago. It was basically only a whites only league at that moment in time. I mean obviously like many institutions we wish we were never segregated but it's important to remember that we were and the struggle that people went through in order to end that segregation. It still took uh, a good number of years uh, where the, you know, all of the major leagues broke the color barrier. So it, it, you know, even though it started in 47, it took a little time for everybody to be comfortable. It's just the fact that it made the game better. It was such a you know, disservice to have these players playing and, and not be allowed in the, in the major leagues. I think the players um, fit into the game so well because they were great, great players. It, it speaks to the quality of play in the Negro Leagues. And I, I think that it's important to understand that the breaking of the color barrier improved the quality of play in Major League Baseball. People should know about the Negro Leagues is that it was really an important part of uh, the civil rights movement in this country. You know, here's a bunch of guys who loved baseball and they found a way to play it even though they were banned from the major leagues. And the fact that they were able to do this uh, in, 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 face, in, do, in face of all the segregation and all the, all the things they had to deal with, I thought it was a tremendous uh, piece of history and I, I, I consider it American history. We're not around it enough. I think we could be around it more. I think there could be a, a much greater, more direct and committed acknowledgement beyond a day or days during the course of the season. We're engaging our history um, in that fashion could do wonders for what our game looks like tomorrow. Thank you.